Hi, I'm Rod Bryant, and welcome to the fourth installment of Deriving the Laws. The Deriving the Noahide Laws, we've gone through, obviously, the first three segments. And today, uh, we're going to finish up the last components of the seven categories. Just want to remind you, if you have any questions, feel free to add a, a comment or a question in the chat box at the actual class uh, at the place where you take the class and I'll be able to return uh, a response to you as soon as possible. I realize this is a brand new format and so there's a little bit of adjusting that you have to get used to. So be patient with yourself, be patient with me and we'll get through this. In the last lesson we reviewed the general principles of the Noah laws of idolatry and blasphemy and their unique details and their positive aspects. In this lesson we will conclude in our overview with the uh, remaining prohibitions of incest, murder, theft, and a limb torn from a living creature. Now, please keep in mind that, that this lesson, as well as other previous few lessons, are only overviews introducing the general principles of the seven categories. Later lessons will be devoted to the specific observance of these categories. Let's first examine incest. The category of incest is fundamentally concerned with the preserving sanctity of a male and female, a family, their relationship, and the integrity of a family unit. As with all of the Noahide laws, it includes a fundamental prohibition, ancillary related prohibitions and positive precepts. As all of the seven Noahide categories, it also includes positive precepts pertaining to marriage, and divorce, and reproduction, modesty, and interactions between the genders. Next, homicide. The prohibition of murder, along with that of, the, of a limb torn from a living animal, has the fullest, most explicit of all in the Noahide laws. Let's examine Genesis 9, 5 through 6. It says, I shall avenge your life's blood, for the hand of any beast I shall avenge it, and from the hand of man for his brother I shall avenge life for anyone who sheds the blood of a man by man shall his blood be shed for man and who was created in the image of God. Now, while murder is the fundamental prohibition here, the category also includes issues such as injury, uh, euthanasia, of the terminally ill, suicide, and abortion. Also included are implied positive mitzvahs such as preserving life and rules pertaining to self-defense. And we'll go into details on these later on. Uh, inclusion in, under the category of homicide is the laws of speech. Now, in Judaism, there are detailed expectations as to one's person and what they may say about another. Damage and negative language are strictly prohibited without compelling reason. We call this Lashon Hara. Though Noahides are not obligated in these laws, these are precepts having logical reason and benefit for all society. Such mitzvot may be uh, voluntarily accepted by Noahides. Furthermore, many authorities learn from the story of Tamar and Judah that Noahides are specifically prohibited from causing embarrassment to each other. It seems, therefore, that Noahides should observe the laws of speech either because it is logical or and beneficial or because of the actual prohibition against causing embarrassment. Theft. Theft is probably the largest and most comprehensive area of Torah law for the Noahides. It covers virtually every conceivable facet of monetary and property law, as well as the whole gamut of business and commercial employment to include real estate law. This category further includes the prohibition of kidnapping, rape, and socially destructive acts. Considering social destructive acts as act of theft or even when you speak evil of someone, you are robbing from them their prosperity and their success in, in social environments. The laws of theft are not solely relevant to the above areas, but also apply to ideology. They dictate the boundaries of Torah tradition for Jews and Noahides and preserve the integrity of the two traditions. Positively, qualities of theft includes respecting and protecting the property of others, conducting one's business honestly and preserving social integrity. Let's talk about the idea 
a limb torn from a living creature. The Talmud lists this as one of the seven laws implied in Genesis 2.16. However, this presents us with a problem. In the Talmud, Rabbi Yehuda, in the name of Rav, uh, points out that Adam was not allowed to eat meat in the Garden of Eden, as it is written, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree, which is the tree of fruit that yields seed, to you they shall be food, and to every beast of the earth, every fowl of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth that is living, as a living soul, every green herb for food. I, I'm, I'm just saying, in Genesis 1.29, what then is the point of commanding Adam regarding the limb of a torn animal, of a living creature, if Adam was not allowed to eat meat? Furthermore, why does the Talmud derive the prohibition of a limb torn from a living animal from Genesis 2.16? How, after all, this commandment, as well as the permission to eat meat, is explicitly dictated to Noah after the flood. So in Genesis 9, 1 through 4, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear and dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and every bird of the sea and upon all things that teem upon the ground and upon the uh, fish of the sea. And to your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be for food for you, as the green herb have I given you everything. The only flesh with their life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Now, Maimonides offers a simple explanation for this. While the seven mitzvahs are uh, referenced in Genesis 2.16, only the first six were actually commanded to Adam. The seventh commandment A limb of an animal that was torn is only given to Noah. This explanation also tells us why the seven mitzvahs are called seven Noahide laws. They were completed with the giving of the seventh mitzvah to Noah. However, Tosfos offers an alternative explanation according to Tosfos. Genesis 1, 29 and 30 only prohibit Adam from killing animals in order to eat their flesh. Adam was nevertheless allowed to eat the flesh of animals that died naturally. This is interesting. Despite the uh, uh, permission, God specifically prohibited Adam from eating flesh torn from an animal while it was living. The latter verse, Genesis 9, 1 through 4, uh, addressed to Noah, expanded the permission of man to eat meat by allowing animals to be killed of their meat. So the distinction between Adam and Noah Adam could eat meat that came from animals that died naturally, and Noah could kill an animal, but it had to be killed and properly without creating torture for the animal. You couldn't tear a limb from the animal. The laws of flesh torn from living animals only applies to birds and mammals. Whether domesticated or wild, it does not apply to fish and crustaceans, insects, and such creatures. If you decide to eat insects, let me know how that goes. Including with this as a category also are precepts regarding cruelty to animals, animal husbandry and crossbreeding, plants, species. In summary, the Noahide laws are actually categories, each one called in the name uh, its basic prohibition, includes a body of related laws, an exhaustive body of related laws. Even though the Talmud enumerates the Noahide laws according to their prohibitions, They include many positive requirements as as well. Many of the categories of Noahide laws overlap with Jewish laws. Some areas of Noahide laws are parallel to Jewish law, being essentially the same in concept and purpose, having different sources and application. Still, many other elements of Noahide law are based upon simple logic and practicality. Since the time of uh, Maimonides, Pashkum have uh, uh, examined and answered numerous questions of Torah law for both Jews and non-Jews around the world. Their writings are primarily sourced available uh, for building a comprehensive and practical understanding of Noahide observance. As we tackle these courses and you need clarification, it's important that you send me a text in the chat box here at the class or join us on Sunday evenings at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time at the Nativ Zoom site so that you can ask questions live. 
I just want to reiterate a couple of things. We have noticed two trends that have come that's a big eye opener for most Noahides. That Jews and Noahides are a community of believers in the one true God. And non-Jews who are not Noahides are in a different category. There are some rabbis that will say, well, everybody is a Noahide. It's just uh, they're not practicing, et cetera, et cetera. Or they're just a Noahide, even though they're Christians and Buddhists, et cetera, et cetera. Well, clearly we find out that this is not the case, that a Noahide is one who accepts the yoke of heaven of the laws given in the Torah for the non-Jew. And they believe in one God, and they reject idolatry, and a vodazara, a vodazara idolatry, and shituf. They, they have nothing to do with the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, accoutrements of other religions and other philosophies. There is only one God. And so a person that takes upon themselves those laws, they are very unique. And the laws that apply to them have crossover into Jewish law which makes Jews and Noahides in a very unique partnership to bring about redemption. God willing, as the years come, we're going to find Noahide communities growing all over the world, Noahide synagogues, Noahide communities that are in relationship with the Jewish community, and may we bring redemption soon, and join me in saying, Amen. Shalom. Stay tuned for the next class.